Ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. In our epistle this morning, St. Peter addresses us as strangers and pilgrims. Holy Scripture and both Christian and non-Christian writings through the centuries abound in images of pilgrimage. One thinks, for example, of the calling of Abraham from his homeland in Ur of the Chaldees and his subsequent wanderings, his promise of the land of Canaan, and his eventual death without having seen the fulfillment of that promise while he yet lived. Again, the 40-year wandering of Moses and the Hebrews in the desert, with their hearts divided between the promised land and the flesh pots of Egypt. While in Greek literature, perhaps the prototypical story of pilgrimage is that of the wandering of the wily Odysseus told by Homer. All these images speak of longing, of a fundamental inability to belong in the place of exile, of desire unfulfilled. But these images of pilgrimage speak perhaps above all of a fundamental restlessness. And while of pilgr stories of pilgrimage tell tales of restlessness for a particular place, most often of a place once known from which one has been exiled, on a deeper level, they speak of another form of restlessness, the universal human restlessness which St. Augustine calls the restless heart. This restlessness is not often for anything we can identify. It is often hopelessly inarticulate. Sometimes we simply know it as anxiety, a form of anxiety that seems to have no antecedent cause. Or perhaps it's anxiety about this or that thing and yet we have a real sense that it's not really this thing or that thing about which we're anxious, but that our anxiety arises from our grasping on to first this thing or that thing is the focus of our anxieties, but we sense that they are more catalysts of our anxiety than causes per se. This morning in our Gospel we witness another form of pilgrimage and another form of restlessness, the restlessness of the sacred humanity of Jesus. Yet this is not an anxious restlessness, but a calm restlessness, acknowledged and embraced as the necessary precondition of rest. A little while and ye shall not see me, and again a little while and ye shall see me. Here is not anxiety. Rather, here is the calm and objective statement of fact. The sacred humanity is literally restless, it is not yet at rest. Yet this does not issue in anxiety, because our Lord knows that in a little while he will return to the Father. High word of God, who once did come, leaving thy Father and thy home, to succor by thy birth our kind, when towards thine advent time declined. Thus the Church sings at her office daily throughout Advent, acknowledging, as it were, the temporal exile of the eternal Son of God. Then again, on the Feast of Corpus Christi, she sings, remember that the first line is identical in the Latin, the heavenly word proceeding forth, yet leaving not his Father's side, and going to his work on earth, hath reached at length life's eventide. Here we see the other side of the earthly exile of Christ. Throughout his earthly sojourn, he leaves not his father's side. The word of God undergoes exile in his human nature, in his sacred humanity, while remaining fully present to the father in the eternal relation that is his eternal begetting from the father's substance. Every exile speaks figuratively of the exiled one leaving a piece of himself in his homeland. We leave our hearts in San Francisco, perhaps, or a bit of our soul over there with so-and-so and so forth. But here, 
it is literally the case that the Son of God is both fully present in his homeland, in God, the Father, in their Trinitarian relations, while at once remaining in exile in the world of time and space. It is precisely this tension that we might call that causes the restlessness, the calm and peaceful restness, restlessness of our Lord in the upper room. Jesus knew, we are told, at the beginning of the whole discourse of which this morning's gospel is a part, that he was come from God and went to God. He was able to see, that is to say, more than we could ever see in this life how the sorrow of the passion is but a moment within the joy of his eternal life in and with the Father. Hearing these words in Eastertide as we do this morning, they have an even greater significance. Even after the resurrection, the eternal word's human nature remains unfulfilled. It was not yet gathered up, drawn completely into his divine life. For he was still undergoing change, still moving from one moment to the next, perceiving first this moment and then that moment. Touch me not, he says to St. Mary Magdalene on the first Easter morning, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. Don't try to grasp on to me as I am here and now before you, but as I'll be when my sacred humanity has become fully present to my divinity, as my divinity has always been present to my sacred humanity. Yet here, at least for him, is no grief, such as we witnessed in Gethsemane. For his passion is in the past. The gathering up of the fragments of our Lord's earthly life has already begun in the resurrection, and he senses clearly that this ingathering will soon be complete. And so there is, at one and the same time, restlessness and peace. Yet while our Lord is at peace, he recognizes that his disciples are not and will not be. Verily, verily, I say unto you that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. The disciples are also restless. But their restlessness, our restlessness, issues in anxiety. We have not yet undergone our own personal death and resurrection. We are not so close to the consummation of all things as was our Lord when he spoke these words. Yet we have been drawn into his death and resurrection. We have undergone new birth in our baptism, so why still anxious? Why this terrible sense of disconnection, this haunting sense of a homeland both known yet only experienced as lost? Well, we know the answer. The Lord sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Somehow, mysteriously, we have known peace, rest, fulfillment, or at least a form of change that we experienced as leading to and containing in itself the fulfillment that was proper to its end. But now, again mysteriously, we remain strangers and pilgrims, yet strangers and pilgrims who no longer even remember our homeland, but only the restlessness of its laws. Ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. Last week, in the proper last gospel for Easter too, we contemplated the image of the Good Shepherd, that great image for Greek and Jew and Christian alike of providential governance. By the beauty of his countenance, that good shepherd is drawing all things to completion in himself, so that where he is, thither we might also ascend and with him continually dwell. 
but for us that is not yet. And yet there is a foretaste. By faith and baptism we have already begun to live in this world the life of the risen and ascended Christ. If we would live it more fully, there is need of loving him more dearly, of growing in his love by gentle and intimate conversation with the one who has loved us into existence and is loving us back to completeness in himself. Here at this altar, we receive his life as fully as we can in this world. So will we enter into the silence of our hearts to continue to feed on him in silent conversation when we have received him? Or will we simply leave as quickly as we can to rejoin the world in its anxieties? The latter is most certainly the easier way. Let us pray that we might be given the grace to do the former. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.